Hey, it's Patty Sharp, CPA and co-founder of Catching Clouds, a leader in e-commerce accounting. Welcome back to another Saturday Slowdown where I like to remind everybody to work on their business and not just in their business. This topic has been kind of simmering around for the past couple of months in the crevices of my brain. Um, I want to talk about women in leadership, mostly because I, I think the tipping point that I hit was I read this article, which I'll talk to you about in just a minute, so stick around. Um, the article like kind of put a light bulb over my head and made me go, oh, I had not actually thought of that from that perspective. So I want to kind of tell you why it's been simmering around and kind of what happened. All right. So um, first of all, I watched this Facebook Live, you know, I watched a Facebook Live thing a couple of months ago. It was, it was around the time that like it was International Women's Day or something like that. And some people that I really like and respect, they, they did this video, invited a woman on, they talked about like challenges for women in the accounting industry and stuff. And I, I have to give credit where credit's due. I, I applaud them for broaching the topic. I applaud them for, I know that they take an active approach in inviting women and also people of color onto their show so that they can hear from different perspectives and things like that. Um, but when they were talking about women in particular, it was just painful for me to listen to because some of the reasons, so they were talking about why women aren't in more positions of power and things like that. And it was like, um, because women are really catty to other women and because um, they're not confident enough, they're not asking for what they want. Women are more risk averse than men. And all these things that even if they're true, like I, I was just sitting there going, so basically what you're telling me is if women would just be like men, then women would have equal representation in the workforce. And it makes no sense to me. And I also feel like women shouldn't have to play the man's game. They should play to their own strengths and approach business the way they're naturally inclined to approach business because women have some amazing gifts. And keep in mind, all of this is just sweeping generalizations. It's all like averages based on societal trends and blah, blah, blah. So I understand if you're in a different situation, just take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. But this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm hearing, yada, yada. And I do agree that as a general rule, women should take more risks, be more confident, um, ask for what they want, you know, be their own self advocate and, and things like that. But, um, but I don't think that explains the, the gaps in gender stuff that we see going on in the industry or across like government and business and everywhere else. All right. And I don't think that women should be more manlike to succeed in business. I think that the key to women advancing is going to be women supporting other women. It's going to be women who are in positions of power, who are kind of pulling up women behind them. Right. Um, but the big question is, how do you get enough, mom like, how do you get enough people, enough women in positions of power to create enough of a tipping point so that things kind of even out, right? So I, I've been thinking about this last couple of months. I, I hear these recurring themes going on everywhere I travel and at the accounting salon that I went to and everything else. And um, so it's been simmering in the back of my head. So I found this first article in the New York Times. It was called, let's see, Women Did Everything Right, Then Work Got Greedy, How America's Obsession with Long Hours Has Widened the Gender Gap by Claire Kane Miller. And I'm putting a link down below because I read it and I was like, oh man, this, this article is amazing. And then when I went back to review it before I did this YouTube video, I, I kind of wanted to just <laughs> read the whole article on the YouTube video. I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to encourage you to just read the article yourself. And I'm just going to give you a couple of key points that like jumped out at me that made me go, oh yeah, that of course. Um, and one is they were talking about how um, 
over the past 20 years or so, work has gotten harder, more intense in order to really make good money. And I'm talking about like in professional industries, like um, lawyers, accountants, um, consultants, things like that. They are expecting people to work more than 40 hours. They're expecting the high performers to work 60, 80 hours, be on call all the time, work nights, work weekends, and basically be at the company's disposal. And as a reward for that, instead of like, if you increase your hours by 50%, you're not going to make 50% more, you're going to make like 100% more. And so you'll have these like dual income families where maybe you've got two attorneys or you've got two doctors and they look at this and they're like, well, we have a family and we'd like our children to survive. So somebody should kind of be in charge of the home stuff and be a more in a more supportive role of the person who's going to be on call all the time. So what ends up happening is because the women society, you know, basically how she's brought up and everything else, women tend to take on at least 50% of the housework, but they'll also take on sometimes 100% of the mental work. So even if you have like a super supportive husband, like I do, and they're chipping in and saying, hey, you know, you just tell me what you need me to do and I'll do that half of that work. That's great that they're doing half the work, but you'll notice that the women are the ones who have to tell the men what it is that needs to be done. That's the mental work. That's the planning and the calendaring and the um, coordinating schedules and school keeping track of the school calendar and the soccer calendar and all that other stuff, right? So, and again, this is a sweeping generalization, so please don't yell at me. But, but this is societally what's going on. So what happens is you've got two high-performing people. They both want to have a career. They maybe the, they have a baby, the woman goes back to work, and then the woman does all of the work at home like somewhere between 75% and 100% after you take into the mental keeping track of stuff things, the mental work. Um, and like two seconds into doing that, they're like, you know, I, I can't do everything. This is too much. And they want to be supportive of their spouse, of course. And their spouse is like, you know what? I got this. I'll just work a little bit more. You take a step back and then voila, this is how we found ourselves where we are. Now, keep in mind, I'm not saying that this is necessarily right or wrong. Um, I did the stay at home mom thing for uh, several years when my kids were young. And I, I know that that is a super valid choice for women and for families. They need to decide that themselves. But what I'm saying is and what the article was kind of arguing is that if we structured work differently, and set it up so that you don't have to make those decisions. Like if you have better decisions, you're going to have better choices and you're going to have better results at work. So for example, if instead of having to work 80 hours a week to be successful, you only had to work 40 hours, then maybe you could both work 40 hours and get all of the things done in your life if you had also flexible work arrangements. You know what I mean? Like if you had more control over your work schedule, you could fit it all in between the two of you without somebody having to take a supportive role. You could just support each other and do it together. The second article I read, which was also really good is, and I'm going to leave a, a link down below, was from Fast Company. It was called, My Boss Gave Me Flex Time When I Became a Mom and It Became Harder to Advance My Career by Anissa Ah, per, 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 sorry, Horton. Sorry if I just butchered that, but there you go. So go read those articles. I like them a lot. Um, and the reason I keep talking about this stuff is, is I feel like change has to start somewhere. And I think by talking about things and getting the conversation going, we can start coming up with ideas and making changes and, and creating a better 
world for all of us and for our, our sons and daughters. And I'm, I'm starting to see change happening, I think. I mean, just if you just look at the company that Scott and I built, we are uh, 100% remote, we're 100% flex time, we're unlimited vacation, and we did that intentionally. We wanted to create a business that our, that we would want to work in, right? So we want something that's going to work for families and not make people choose between work and life and let them figure out how to kind of put those two together because that's what everybody wants, right? I also keep bringing up topics like this on my YouTube channel because I want people to know, even though it's not like technically e-commerce, it is business related and it's life related. And I know so many e-commerce sellers, they created their business because they wanted a work-life balance. They, they wanted to design a life that they wanted to live that included work, but also gave them flexibility to do it in on their own terms. And I, I've seen, um, and I've talked to some e-commerce sellers, women in this case, where they said that they've had to, they, they've had to like create these fictitious operations managers uh, with male names, like maybe their grandfather's name or something like that, because their suppliers weren't taking them seriously until they got an email from their fictitious male named operations manager. You know, I'm, I'm not kidding, like this stuff actually happens. And but the difference is, we're hearing stories about this, not it's not great that that's happening. But now people are talking about it. And I'm seeing things on Twitter where if there's a, a conference, like there was a conference in the UK that had an all male panel talking about the future of accounting, and a whole bunch of people, not just women, men too, are like, um, does the future of accounting not include women or people of color? <laughs> you know, so people are starting to get called out on these things, not to shame them, but just to get people to start thinking about their actions. I have a, at almost the exact same time, totally not related to this at all. He's not in accounting, but I have a friend who tweeted something where he said, hey, um, I, I'm done with the days of being on panels that don't include any diversity. I, I don't agree to talk on those if I'm invited. And I was thinking, oh my God, if every guy on the planet took that same stand and just said, you know what, if there's no diversity on the pa panel, then I'm not interested. The problem of male speakers taking over like the whole world, like monopolizing 80, 90% of the stage, that would be over overnight that it would be monumental so um i was super proud of him for that and um i wanted to tell you that just so that you know you would kind of think about that in the back of your mind and i know i'm seeing women in this industry too are are taking action they're they're creating groups where <laughs> where we're talking about world domination or we're talking about um how the future is going to look and what we need to do to make a future that's inclusive of all the people that are in our society and not just a few. So, all right, so whew, off my soapbox. Um, I hope you like this video. If you did, please like, comment, and share. If you haven't already, please subscribe. I'll catch you later.